The Stauffer family derived its name from the castle in Swabia, Germany, which was the dynasty's original power base. Frederick von Stauffen, appointed Duke of Swabia by Henry IV in 1079, was a key imperial supporter. However, Henry V, the last of the Salian emperors, left no male heirs, and the struggle to succeed him simply highlighted the lack of focus in the German national identity. By the end of his reign, Henry V had in effect conceded victory to the papacy in the long-running investiture contest, and the campaign to provide national leadership had all but ended. That deficiency was also to be a Stauffen opportunity. By 1125, when the reign of Henry V was over, Lothair was 50 years of age, childless and guileless. He was thus the ideal candidate for those who wanted merely a figurehead king of the Germans. His wife's family, the Welfs of Bavaria, supported Lothair's regnal ambitions, and in a contested election he defeated Frederick to become king in 1125. The German nobility's decision was nonetheless controversial, since it ignored the rights of dynastic succession. Frederick's mother, Agnes, was Henry IV's daughter, and Henry V had therefore been his uncle. Frederick and his brother Conrad, Duke of Franconia, thus inherited as family members the territories personally owned by Henry V and his Salian ancestors. However, they also claimed the crown lands gained by the Salians as emperors. This amounted to a declaration of war, and in the ensuing conflict most of the German imperial cities backed the brothers. Lothair's imperial coronation by Pope Innocent II in 1133, although a token of subservience to the papacy, nonetheless solidified his authority, and the Stauffen conceded defeat in the following year. Recognition of Stauffen leadership came after Lothair's death in 1137, when Conrad was elected to succeed him. Factionalism nonetheless persisted, and the wealth leader Henry the Proud, Duke of Bavaria and of Saxony, contested Conrad's election. As Lothair's son-in-law, Henry had inherited the Saxon duchy. He was immensely rich, and therefore well-placed to start a civil war. Conrad's decision to deprive Henry of his duchies proved unpopular in both Bavaria and Saxony, and that divisiveness led to the first prolonged period of wealth ghibelline armed conflict. In 1152, Conrad lay on his deathbed. His son was only six years old and his brother Frederick had died five years previously. Conrad was never crowned emperor, but he recognized in his brother's son, Swabia's new Duke Frederick, those qualities of military prowess personal charm and ambitious idealism that might drive the family on to imperial greatness. It was the North Italians he tried to conquer who would dub this particular Frederick Barbarossa, and Conrad's nomination of his nephew heralded a century of Stauffen's struggle for European predominance. Frederick I Barbarossa devoted himself to the cause of restoring the imperial power both in Germany and North Italy. The 10th century dynasty of Etonian emperors provided him with an inspiration in this regard, and so did Charlemagne's memory. He was crowned king of the Germans in Aachen in 1152, and returned there in 1165 to attend the great service marking Charlemagne's canonization. His imposing physical presence, crowned by flaming red hair, contributed to his charisma, as did his keen practical intelligence and courtly grace. Symbols and gestures were also needed, because he had few other cards to play outside the Stauffen power base in Swabia and Franconia. However, the inventiveness with which he impressed himself on the German public's imagination meant that his leadership acquired a mythic quality, even in his own lifetime. He was crowned king of Italy in Pavia in 1154, and an initially obliging papacy gave him an emperor's crown in 1155. Those were largely nominal roles. But his lineage gave Barbarossa a more tangible asset since his mother Judith belonged to the Bavarian ducal house. This great representative of the Ghibelline interest was therefore also a wealth, and that fact encouraged the hope of reconciliation between the two factions. This, though, was to underestimate the tenacity of Henry the Lion, the wealth leader who had inherited the Duchy of Saxony from his father, Henry the Proud, following its restoration to the family by King Conrad in 1142. Henry the Lion was Barbarossa's equal in grasping the importance of symbolic gesture and, unlike his rival, he had the means to express his vision of German glory through artistic patronage. Henry was Barbarossa's supporter initially, and the Duchy of Bavaria was therefore returned to his dynasty in 1156. His foundation of Munich, together with Henry's embellishment of Brunswick, his capital in Saxony, 
marked the Duke's command of a Saxon-Bavarian power block stretching from the North Sea to the Alps. Marriage to Matilda, daughter of England's Henry II, was further confirmation of Henry the Lion's standing as one of Europe's greatest princes. Barbarossa's decision to return Bavaria to wealth control was part of his initial policy of compromise with regard to the fractious German princes. Henry II Jasomurgat, the ousted Duke of Bavaria who was also Margrave of Austria, was compensated with the title of Duke of Austria. Initially, Barbarossa's papal policy was similarly realistic, since he wanted an ally in the struggle to restore German imperial influence in North Italy. In 1160, however, he was excommunicated by Pope Alexander III, who had decided that such ambitions undermined the papacy's own position as an Italian territorial power. In retaliation, Barbarossa backed the claims of dissident clergy who rejected the legitimacy of the official papal leadership, and it was therefore the antipope Paschal III who canonized Charlemagne at the emperor's request. Henry the Lion did not share Barbarossa's conviction that true German glory required an Italian dimension. Moreover, he had his own, anti-Slavic, campaigns to fight on the northeast frontier. His decision not to join the emperor's military expedition against the city of Rome in 1166 contributed to its defeat, and the pattern was repeated in Barbarossa's fifth Italian expedition, launched in 1174. Barbarossa was again denied Henry's support, and he was decisively defeated by the combined forces of Lombard North Italy at the Battle of Legnano on May 29, 1176. As a result, the emperor had to moderate his Italian ambitions and the subsequent peace deal arrived at in Venice required his recognition of the papal state's sovereign independence. Barbarossa's title as king of Italy remained merely nominal, therefore, but in Germany he was able to punish Henry the Lion for disloyalty to the imperial cause. Roman law was one of the great rediscoveries of 12th century Europe, and Barbarossa relied on its distinctive methodology to override traditional German law and give new substance to the imperial authority. In 1180, the case against Henry was brought before an imperial court of law, and use of the Roman system ensured that the duke was deprived of his lands and declared an outlaw. A subsequent military invasion of Saxony by Barbarossa's army led to Henry's exile in England, although he was allowed to return in 1184. The emperor's death during the Third Crusade contributed to the evolution of the Barbarossa legend. Having reconciled himself to the papacy, Barbarossa took the cross at Mainz in 1188, but was drowned in the Salaf River, in Armenia, on June 10, 1190 as his army approached Antioch. Attempts at preserving the body in vinegar failed. Barbarossa's flesh was buried in Antioch, his bones ended up in Tyre Cathedral, while his heart and vital organs were interred in Tarsus. The Norman Kingdom of Sicily had been a papal ally in the anti stauffen Italian opposition. William II was keen to make peace, however, since he wished to concentrate his forces on a campaign against the Greek Empire. The Treaty of Venice therefore stipulated that William's Aunt Constance, daughter of Roger II, would marry Barbarossa's son, the future Emperor Henry VI. That same year William married Joan, the daughter of England's Henry II, and he can hardly have imagined that the eventual marriage of his aunt at the age of 32, in 1186, would lead to the end of Norman rule in Sicily. Constance was an elderly bride by the standards of the age, but she was nevertheless William's legitimate heir and his death without issue in 1189 had momentous consequences. Henry VI and Constance were crowned emperor and empress in 1191 by Pope Celestine III, and by then both were intent on pursuing their Sicilian claim. Southern Italy's Norman nobles, appalled at the prospect of German rule, had chosen Tancred, a grandson of Roger II, to be their king and the final rebellion of Henry the Lion meant that Henry VI needed to remain in Germany at the start of his reign. By 1194, however, the German situation was under control, and a deal with the North Italian cities allowed Henry's army to cross their territories on the way to the southern kingdom. He was also by now suddenly and enormously rich, thanks to the payment of a ransom in order to secure the release from captivity of his prisoner, Richard I of England. Plantagenet support for Tancred and for Henry, the lion played their part in the emperor's hostility, and Richard had quarreled with Leopold, Duke of Austria, during the Third Crusade. Richard's seizure by Leopold while traveling back to England gave the emperor a chance to renew his coffers by demanding, and getting, a ransom of 150,000 marks. Tancred died in February 1194, 
and the divided Norman nobility was no match for the imperial army that took Palermo on November 20th. On Christmas Day, Henry VI was crowned king of Sicily, which he would rule as joint monarch with Constance. The papacy's worst fear had been realized, a German imperial hegemony on both its northern and southern frontiers. It had been a year of wonders, including the birth on Boxing Day of an heir to Constance and Henry. When her labor began, the queen was traveling through central Italy to join her husband in Palermo, and she stopped at the town of Gessai, in the March of Ancona, in order to give birth. She was now 40 years of age and, in order to allay any doubts about the authenticity of the event, she gave birth in public, surrounded by courtiers and local witnesses within the tented pavilion raised for the occasion in Jesai's central square. The child was then taken to Assisi, where he was baptized and christened Frederick. The sense of wonder that surrounded Frederick at birth clung to him as he grew to manhood and stayed with him throughout his life. Contemporaries would dub him Stupor Mundi, the world's astonishment, because of his questing intellect, restless personality, and unconventional ways. In the eyes of the papacy, which excommunicated him repeatedly, he was an antichrist figure, a religious skeptic who refused to go on crusade. But so far as the Stauffen were concerned, Frederick II was the best thing since Barbarossa. Henry VI wanted his title to be hereditary, and he therefore secured Frederick's election as king of the Germans when the infant was just two years old. But the emperor's death a year later led his brother, Philip of Swabia, and Henry the Lion's son, Otto of Brunswick, to make their own claims to the German throne. Constance, meanwhile, kept her son in Sicily where he was crowned king in 1198, the year of her death. She renounced on his behalf any claim to the German throne and sent Henry IV's retinue back to Germany. Frederick spent most of his life in Sicily's cosmopolitan ambience, but the claims of his Stauffen lineage were not so easily denied, and rebels against Otto of Brunswick, who had become the German king and emperor, elected him to be the rival king of the Germans on three occasions. An election was one thing, but making it effective was another. Even after the third election in 1215, it was another five years before Pope Honorius III crowned Frederick Emperor in Rome. His numerous concessions to the German princes left them firmly in the saddle, and in 1232 Frederick allowed them the right of veto over imperial legislative initiatives. The ideal of a German national monarchy waned accordingly, but Frederick's devolution of his rights to the German princes included an accommodation with the Welf dynasty, and by the mid-1230s Germany's welf ghibelline conflict was over. From 1220 to 1236 Frederick was either in Sicily or on crusade and after a final visit to Germany in 1236 to 1237, he never went there again. It was his Sicilian kingdom that inspired Frederick as ruler, and the constitutions of Melfi remain a landmark in the constitutional development of written, as opposed to customary, law. That Italian dimension, along with Frederick's crusading exploits, brought him into prolonged and embittered confrontation with the papacy. Frederick's failure to join the Fifth Crusade contributed to its defeat in 1221 and he was excommunicated in 1227 after illness delayed his participation in the Sixth Crusade. By now Frederick was, at least nominally, king of Jerusalem following his marriage to Yolanda, the heiress to the Latin kingdom and whose father John of Brienne transferred the title to his son-in-law. Frederick joined the Crusade in 1228 at a time that inconvenienced the papacy, and a second excommunication followed. He operated independently while on Crusade and, Taking advantage of a Syrian-Egyptian divide within the region's Ayyubid rulers, the emperor negotiated the return of the city of Jerusalem, lost to the kingdom since 1187. On March 18, 1229 Frederick, still an excommunicate, crowned himself king in Jerusalem. However, the tensions between his own agents and the kingdom's nobility erupted in open warfare, and Ayyubid authority over the city was re-established in 1244. Frederick's German concessions meant that he could concentrate on North Italian campaigning, and in 1237 he won a decisive victory over the Lombard League at the Battle of Corte Nuova. However, his demand that Milan be surrendered unconditionally only strengthened the resistance of the North Italian communes. A frightened papacy renewed Frederick's excommunication in 1239, and he responded by annexing large areas of the Papal States. The election of Sinibaldo Fieschi to the papacy as Innocent IV brought to the fore an incendiary personality who loathed the Stauffen adventurism. 
In the summer of 1245, the Pope declared Frederick deposed as emperor. He also plotted, unsuccessfully, against him in Germany by backing Heinrich, Landgrave of Thuringia, as an alternative king. Frederick met his nemesis at Parma following the city's rebellion in the summer of 1247 against the imperial government that had been imposed on it. Frederick's army settled into a lengthy siege, but after its defeat at the Battle of Parma, rebellion spread to the rest of North Italy. The emperor lost control of the areas of the papal states he had annexed, only to regain them by the beginning of 1250. But the capture and imprisonment of his son Enzio, imperial vicar general for North Italy, by the victorious Bolognese following the Battle of Fosalta was a debilitating blow. Frederick was by now ailing, and following his death on December 13, 1250 at the castle of Fiorentino in Puglia, his son Conrad succeeded him as king and ruler of both Sicily and Germany. He was unable, however, to assert military control in Sicily. After Conrad died of malaria in 1254, it was his half-brother, Manfred, the true inheritor of their father's physical and intellectual energy, who exercised power there as regent on behalf of the dead king's infant son Conradin. In 1258, Manfred took advantage of a false rumor that Conradin had died and quickly crowned himself. He then refused to give up the crown and embarked on a series of highly successful anti-papal campaigns in northern and central Italy. The papacy turned to Charles, Count of Anjou, as its protector against this latest Stauffen enemy, whom it inevitably excommunicated. Invested with the Kingdom of Sicily by the papacy in 1263, Charles defeated and killed Manfred at the Battle of Benevento on February 26, 1266. The Stauffen had lost their kingdom in the sun and the dynastic line was extinguished when Conradin was beheaded as a traitor following his capture by French forces near Naples. The Bavarian knight and poet Wolfram von Eschenbach, author of Perzival, was not the first great artist to be attracted by the story. Crétine de Troyes, author of the unfinished Perceval, Le Conte du Graal, was also inspired by the tale. He dedicated the romance to his patron Philip, Count of Flanders, and his account of the Arthurian hero has a stylistic and thematic connection with Pereter, one of the medieval Welsh prose tales collectively known as the Mabinogi. The true origin of Perzival's story is unknown, but the variety of its treatments shows how literary material reflected local circumstances within a cosmopolitan ambience. Von Eschenbach's poem, arguably the greatest of the German medieval epics, is infused by the knightly ethic with its portrayal of the need for compassionate love when searching for a healing wisdom. Parzival's grief-stricken mother, Herzeloid, has consciously brought him up to be ignorant of chivalric knighthood following the death in battle of the boy's father Gamuret. Itinerant knights, however, inform the youth of the glories of Arthur's court at Camelot, and Parzival departs for the island of Britain. His despairing mother, however, dresses him in a fool's clothes in the hope that his appearance will exclude him from courtly life and the dangerous attractions of knighthood. Perzival's strange appearance makes him an object of curiosity at Camelot, and he is instructed in the need for knightly self-control. An even higher calling is reserved for him, however, and he arrives at the castle of the Grail where he meets the mysterious Anfortis, the wounded Fisher King. Anfortis is the keeper of the Grail, but his wound means that he can do little other than fish, and his suffering mirrors that of his kingdom, which seems doomed to sterility. Many knights have tried to heal him, but only an individual with exceptional spiritual self-understanding can relieve Anfortis's suffering. That penitent knight turns out to be Parzival, who therefore holds the key to the regeneration of the kingdom itself. Liberated from earlier ignorance and self-centeredness, Parzival learns that Anfortis is, in fact, his mother's brother, and he himself becomes in time the Grail King. Von Eschenbach's highly charged account of knighthood's challenges and tribulations gives a mythological dimension to the German Empire of the Stauffen. His primary emphasis is on the need for a spiritual self-understanding, but the theme of a regenerated kingdom that has recovered from its wounds and divisions has obvious affinities with the German Empire's political and military struggles in the age of the Stauffen princes.